Hi, uh, my name is Brendan Scott, and I'm the Saurian in Residence uh, at Cavan County Council for the Decade of Centenaries Programme. And this short webisode will investigate attacks made on Maxwell property around the shores of Loch Sheelan during uh, this kind of the sort of War of Independence and Civil War period and, and following that as well. And as I'm sure many people know, uh, the Maxwells of Farnham were Cavan's premier landed gentry family ennobled by the English monarchy, at one point to the status of heir, but normally to the lower level of baron. At the height of the power and influence in the 19th century, they owned 28,000 acres of land in Cavan. The Maxwell family had more than just one branch, and another minor branch of the family lived at Fortland and Arley Cottage on the shores of Loch Sheelan. And these are the uh, houses here, that's Arley Cottage there, uh, probably from uh, the late 19th or early 20th century, just before this stuff that we're going to talk about happened. And there's uh, Fortland there as well. Uh, by the early 20th century, uh, these two properties were owned by a guy called Captain Richard Maxwell, who was a cousin of Arthur Kendis Maxwell, the 11th Lord Farnham. And it's his property, Richard Maxwell's property, that we'll be looking at in this webisode. Maxwell held two to 3,000 acres from his father, Colonel Henry Maxwell, under whose will 500 pounds was due to uh, Richard's mother from the profits of the land. And she also had the right to live in either of those houses in Arley or in Fortland. Uh, these two houses, which are on the shores, as I say, of Loch Sheelan, uh, both of which were owned by uh, Captain Richard Maxwell, uh, were attacked and looted by what was described as large numbers of men who descended like a swarm of locusts in 1924, stripping both properties bare. Uh, nothing on these properties was safe during these raids and trees were felled, gates and railings were removed and more. One witness account stated that carts were going through the domains night and day and great crowds of people were at the houses. A letter was sent to the army barracks in Cavan praising them of the situation and suggesting uh, that a military patrol at Fortland and Arley may dissuade the looting. Now that doesn't seem to have happened. Um, Richard left for England in 1920 and his precarious financial position is indicated by the fact that w once he got there he started uh, 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 he started the band or what he called rather grandly an orchestra so he had to uh, make his living as a musician uh, which w was a pretty big fall uh, yeah, for one of the Maxwells uh, and incidentally they're actually obviously a musical family there's talk uh, when the houses are raided uh, that a violin went missing that belonged to Richard's sister that cost a hundred pounds um, before they had left uh, they, the, all the family had moved into Arley alone and they rented out Fortlands, the, the house here uh, for fishermen during the fishing season. So they'd obviously been having some financial problems in the run-up uh, to uh, 1920 and, and that sort of war of independence period. And that's when they went over to England and, and uh, rented out the properties. Um, once the houses were uh, looted, uh, Richard Maxwell put in a compensation claim for just under £40,000, but he received just over £3,000. Uh, as due to the theft of the items, Maxwell couldn't fully account for all the property, and he hadn't sought protection from the civic guards for the property. These were the reasons given uh, for his failure uh, to get a bigger uh, settlement. Now, from the beginning of the War of Independence through the Civil War, a period of roughly about four years beginning in 1919, numerous RIC barracks, army barracks and big houses were singled out for attack from various Irish forces. Yet, although Captain Maxwell's family, his cousins in Farnham House, just outside Cavan, uh, were left untouched during the revolutionary period, Arthur Maxwell, this man here, the 11th Lord Farnham, uh, made the decision nevertheless in the early 1920s to uproot the family from Farnham and move to England, where he found employment as a private secretary to a guy called Sir Glyn Hampton West, who was chairman of a number of English steel and iron companies. And again, gives you an idea of the financial position he was in, that he had to take a job as a private secretary. Farnham sold off some of the goods in the house before uh, the family left for England, although that was probably more to do with they needed some ready cash for the move rather than worrying about was the house going to be looted or not. Now, perhaps his position, relatively close to Cavan Town, and the fact that it was still a working farm, contributed to the uh, you know lack of attacks on the on the estate. Uh, possibly the opportunity for attack never fully presented itself, but for whatever reason, Farnham House uh, remained unscathed and intact throughout this period. 
others in Cavan, as we'll see in a minute, uh, were quite so lucky as that. So to get back uh, to Captain Richard Maxwell, uh, his woes had begun earlier than 1924 as Josiah Bleakley, who was the bailiff on his estates, had been sent threatening letters, supposedly from the IRA, uh, around 1923, one of which read as follows. This is the letter here. It's it's uh, kept in the Farnham Archive in uh, the Johnson Central Library. But they've got a wonderful archive of Farnham material uh, in there. And it says, notice, sir, we are informed that you are taking great interest in Maxwell's land and the 11 months take. By order of IRA, you are requested not to take any part in Mr. Maxwell's land until the homeless men of Calvin is provided for. You are also requested to write to Mr. Maxwell and let him know that the men of Calvin is ready to meet him on the earliest possible date to arrange the farms. Signed, IRA. Now, we don't know whether uh, anyone ever made that meeting. I somehow doubt it. Um, and then there was a postscript as well at the bottom there. It says, hands off Maxwell land. I guess you have your dealing trick very well out of it. Now, Bleakley also received visits from men claiming uh, to be in the IRA as well. who threatened to empty the revolvers into him if he was responsible for Maxwell's compensation claim. So that if he went to court uh, supporting Maxwell's compensation claim, the IRA wouldn't come back and shoot him. Uh, these men were hoping that if the men were destroyed, uh, then that the estate would be broken up and they'd, uh, they'd get it under the various land acts uh, that were being passed around this time. Now, once gone, the estate was plundered from top to bottom in an example quite unlike, I think, any other in Calvin during this period. I certainly can't think of any other uh, that had uh, the plundering done to it that was done uh, here uh, out at, out at uh, Fortlands in Ireland. And in early February 1924, Maxwell's hearing for compensation came up at the at the quarter of sizes in Calvin. That's a, a, a headline from the Anglo South uh, about the court case. It's a very, very long report. It spreads over three pages uh, in not the entire three pages, but columns and on three pages. And it's a very long, very detailed uh, uh, report. A Maxwell solicitor said that from September 1922, large numbers of men came to Arley and Fortland, descending on them, as I said, like a swarm of locusts was the quote used, until nothing was left of the houses except the remnants of the four walls. Arley, according to the solicitor, was absolutely sacked and demolished. Uh, and the quote goes, uh, they ripped up the floors, tore down the uh, roof and ceilings, and in the demolition process, uh, took away doors, windows, ceilings, mantelpiece, mantelpieces, grates, and other articles. It is certainly one of the most extraordinary cases of wanton destruction that I know of, even in the circumstances of recent years. There were hundreds of men engaged in the depredations, and they never left at either place an outhouse that they, did, that they did not entirely demolish between September 1922 and early and February 1923. So that's the quote that, that he gave. So, so he's saying he's never seen the like of this anywhere. And really, there isn't nothing like this in Calvin for this period. Uh, timber was also cut down and about 50 to 60 gates taken away. An architect who surveyed the site uh, after all this damage was done repeated the damages that had been made to it and also added that the slates were gone and there was four or five foot of debris inside the houses. Uh, the windows uh, from the dairy uh, had been gone as well. Uh, the boathouse at, at Arley, this is it here. You can see the guy standing outside the oars. It was uh, destroyed as well. The summer house was taken down as well. And, and so this architect reckoned it cost 17000 to repair Arley and almost thirty to repair Fortlands, uh, both the main house and the outhouses. So to, to get everything back to the way it was, was it going to cost according to this man, £47,000. Now, both Maxwell, uh, who was at the time, who was in London, and Bleakley, uh, the bailiff, who we mentioned a minute ago, uh, they both received threatening letters telling them not to attend the court. But despite the letters, they both attended court. Uh, Bleakley informed the court that the raids at Arley uh, and Fortland began in September or October 1922, and that the caretaker, a woman called Mrs Moore, informed Bleakley about this and gave him the keys saying that she could not continue to look after the place anymore. You can't really blame her for that. Uh, Bleakley's dates are a bit contradictory. They don't always add up. Uh, and he blamed the fact that, these, that when this was pointed out to him, saying, well, your dates aren't adding up here. He said, well, my books and my accounts were all stolen from me, so I don't have them to, to uh, 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 go back to. Uh, Bleakley, uh, according to Bleakley, he began, once the raid started, he began to sell anything he could get his hands on in order to raise some money rather than have it all be stolen outright from him. Uh, 
Uh, and by this method, he reckoned he made about ninety pounds. Large numbers came to buy stuff from Bleakley, uh, and anything that wasn't sold, the men simply took with them in full sight of the bailiff. And the bailiff was well, he says this people just picked up stuff and just took it with them. And they even sometimes asked them for a receipt, even though they were stealing the stuff. Said, "Give us a receipt for that," and which he says he refused to do. Uh, so as I said to you then. On the 22nd of January, 1923, uh, Bleakley was uh, uh, visited by four men with revolvers who told him that if he uh, continued to sell material from Ireland and Fortland, he'd be shot. So don't sell anymore. We're just going to come and steal the stuff. That was uh, what they were telling him. Um, and uh, a few days after that, more men came to the house, took the receipts, took the books, took the accounts, all that sort of stuff that Bleakley had had, took that all with them. Uh, the court then accused bleakly of making up the raid on his house he said the, the court says well no 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 there was no raid on your house at all what, what are you talking about um and and the bailiff denied this uh he was asked why he hadn't gone to the civic guards in Calvin or granard and bleakly said first well there was none in killing a left but then he was prompted well there's guards in Calvin and granard so why don't you go there and then he said well i, wa I wasn't given authority to go to the guards so i didn't do it he was then accused of trying to sell as much as possible from the site. And I think the, the inference that was being made here is that he was trying to pocket the money himself. Uh, Bleakley replied that if he had gone to the civic guards, he would have been putting his own life in danger because he'd already been threatened uh, uh, with, with uh, murder uh, if, if, he, if, if he did anything that the IRA didn't like. Um, and the, the inference is also being made that he was allowing theft on the site in order to build up as strong a compensation claim as possible. Uh, so Bleakley denied all of that. Uh, and he was also accused, as I say, of pocketing the money. Uh, Bleakley denied this as well. And a former steward on the estate, a guy called Lahey, uh, was prosecuted in the Republican courts uh, for, for stealing a bath from the site. And uh, there's a guy called Philip Sheridan from Ballyhealan who was called, he had been president of the Republican court, and he's called to the civic court, and uh, he was president of the Republican court that had prosecuted Lahey for stealing. Sheridan himself said, yes, I bought material from the estate. So he certainly, the IRA, so the Republican court, I should say at least, was making a distinction between buying from the estate and stealing from the estate. And Sheridan instead blamed who he called Maxwell's hirelings for theft on the estate. And he was saying, no, 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 uh, they're just trying to blacken us by saying we're stealing all the stuff, we were buying it. And anyone who stole, we prosecuted them ourselves. So, you know, it's it's hard it's hard to know uh, what the truth of the matter really is. So, as I said, Maxwell applied for thirty nine thousand four hundred twenty four pounds for the destruction of Arley and Fortlands, but only received three thousand one hundred twenty four pounds. So, we saw there a minute ago that the Farnham House and Cavan was left untouched, but all this stuff happened out. Uh, out at Arley and Fortlands. So what had made that branch of the Maxwell family so unpopular in the locality? From late 1922 into early 1923, Richard Maxwell had issued a number of writs against tenants for non-payment of rent, uh, which were resisted by the tenants. In 1922, the tenants, uh, Maxwell's tenants, had signed a petition requesting the abatement of re rents as falling prices for farm produce had not been accompanied by a similar drop in the rents. Now, Maxwell, who, as we've seen, was stuck for money, probably wasn't going to go down that road. Um, but that made him very unpopular. And his refusal to compromise made, he was an absentee landlord, as I don't forget, made him very unpopular among his tenantry. Uh, Richard's father, Colonel Henry Maxwell, had refused in 1917 to sell land under the Land Acts from the estate to a guy called Matthew McCabe on the grounds that McCabe was a member of Sinn Féin. Now, McCabe complained about this, and he swore an affidavit in which he claimed that the reason for Maxwell's refusal to sell was not for membership in Sinn Féin, but rather because he was a Catholic. And perceived injustices like this likely played a part as well in the attacks on this particular estate during the early 1920s. Now, as has been demonstrated elsewhere, uh, other attacks on big houses in Cavan occurred during this time. In December 1920, Lanesborough Lodge at Quivy uh, in Beltorbet was raided. In May of the following year, the rectory and the lodge at Quivy were burned down. Brackley House outside Bomboy was burned. 
and its elderly occupant, uh, the, re- the retired Church of Ireland cleric John Finlay, was killed in June 1921. And I did a pot, I did a, a webisode about that a year or two back. Uh, the White Venables home in Red Hills was burned in that same month in June 1921. And there had been rumours that both it and Brackley House were to be commandeered uh, by British forces to use as military bases, which may explain why they were targeted. On the 28th of June 1921, the same day that the White's Venable, uh, the White Venables home in Red Hills was destroyed, the borough's residence in Stradone was burned. Uh, they seem to be coordinated attacks. Castle Saunderson, owned by the Saunderson family, who are cousins of the Farnhams, was taken over by the auxiliaries in mid-1921. Uh, by the spring of 1922, the family had left permanently, leaving the property open to wide-scale looting. And on the night of the 8th of April 1922, Travers Blackley, the Farnham estate agent, was attacked by a group of armed men in his home and forced to flee for his life with his family, never to return to Cavan. Part of this and the, res- and the derisory compensation which he received, he put in a compensation claim as well. And I've done, a, a, there's an online lecture about that particular incident as well. Uh, this was probably down to his unpopularity in Cavan. He seems to have been an abrasive enough kind of character. When another Protestant landowner, Major General Oliver Nugent, returned to his home with Farron Connell in Mount Nugent, Cavan in 1920, uh, having been away uh, since the war, he was unsure what reception he and his family could re- expect to receive. And in a letter to one of his daughters, Nugent wrote, I wonder what it would be like at home. I do not expect the people will be allowed to show any civility, and I think everything is likely to be very unpleasant. But I do not think they will shoot at us when we appear out of doors. I hope they won't. It would be such a nuisance to have to go out for a walk crawling on one's tummy. So he had a bit of a sense of humour about it, uh, Oliver Nugent, at least. Um, and he needn't have worried too much, bar losing a car to Raiders in 1921. He and his property were left pretty much untouched. And again, I think that speaks to uh, the relative popularity of Nugent. Nugent seems to have been well enough liked in the area. So I think that had something to do with it too. Uh, but all of these examples uh, demonstrate what Terry Dooley, Professor Terry Dooley, has called the plight of Protestants in the border region at this time, where, as in Leitrim and Cavan and Longford, houses and orange halls were raided, Protestant businesses were boycotted, and Protestants attacked and killed. Now, Maxwell continued to experience problems with his estate, and an ineffectual notice was placed in the anglo Celt in August 1924, which stated that any persons found hunting or shooting on the Arley and Fortland domain or trespassing in any way will be prosecuted after this date, the 23rd of August, 1924. Now, you know, so so if that notice was put in, obviously the, 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 there was poaching going on on the estates, which they were trying to stop. And I don't think uh, it would have been a very effectual notice, I don't think. And things went from bad to worse for Richard. Uh, there was a letter dated a few weeks after that, uh, the 4th of September, 1924, from a guy called George William Fraser from Bally Jim Stuff. Uh, and that letter was sent to Maxwell's solicitor to inform his client, Captain Maxwell, the Fraser's brother and sister-in-law were pulling out of the purchase of Crover Cottage, which was part of the Fortland estate, following the burning of the Orange Lodge at nearby Ballymacue. These events had sufficiently worried the couple uh, that they decided to withdraw their offer. And it seems that Captain Richard Maxwell, formerly of Arley and Fortlands, and now exiled to playing music in London, just could not catch a break. Uh, so just to finish up, uh, my thanks as always to Cabin County Council, especially the Library Service, for all of their continued support, in particular Emma Clancy, the County Librarian, Sinead McArdle and John Smith. And thank you all very much as well for tuning in, and hopefully I will see you all again very soon. Thank you. <laughs>